Welcome to Mintel's Little Conversation, real conversations with actionable insights into what consumers want and why. My name is Andrew McDougall and I'm Director of Beauty and Personal Care Research at Mintel and excited to bring you our latest installment chatting with more of our lovely experts. And today we're going to be taking a look at one of the hot topics of the moment. Um, artificial intelligence definitely seems to be something that's hot on the lips uh, and everyone seems to be talking and asking about it. Uh, today we're specifically going to be looking at things from a generative AI sense um, and as experts in what consumers want and why, uh, we're going to be looking at it from a consumer and market research standpoint as well. Uh, now, such a big topic uh, needs some trusted big names to help navigate. So I'm very, very excited. I'm delighted today to be joined by two of our top experts in this particular area. Uh, first up, I'm delighted to be joined by Jason Thompson, who is Mintel's Senior Vice President of Innovation, working on our futures team and looking at how tech is going to impact us all. So hello, Jason. Welcome to the pod. Hi, Andy. And I'm also equally thrilled as well to be joined by our category director for media and technology, uh, Thomas Slide. So welcome, Tom, to the pod as well. Hi. I'm really excited to have you both on the pod today. As I say, I really feel like I'm in safe hands, um, which is always nice uh, when we're discussing such a such a big topic like this. Um, but I definitely think before we sort of explore exactly what that means for consumers and what it means for um, for market research specifically, I thought a good opening question would be looking at what do we actually mean by generative AI as opposed to sort of all the other artificial intelligence out there? Uh, and also, what will this mean for industry? What does it mean for consumers? Is it something we should be wary of? Is it something that's very exciting for us uh, looking at things going forward? Um, Jason, I don't know if you want to take that one up first. Yeah, sure. Thanks, Andy. Um, well, generative AI is uh, a type of artificial intelligence uh, where you have really big neural networks, really big AI models that are trained on huge amounts of data and they're designed to produce, to generate new and novel content. So typically, uh, everyone I'm sure has heard of ChatGPT. You put some text in and the generative AI will generate new text based on your prompts or your instructions. Or perhaps you've used DALI or MidJourney where you put in a prompt and the generative AI will generate an image for you. And so really it's a it's a type of AI model that's really come to the fore in the in the in the past three or four years um, where it allows you to give the model direction and instructions and then the model looks at all of its patterns that it's learned from huge data sets it's processed and it uses that to generate new and novel content based on what you direct it to. Did that make sense? <laughs> It did make sense, yes. And you mentioned some models that I have already played around with and played with before, and I'm sure many other people have as well. Um, I know ChatGPT is something that um, I think a lot of people are sort of using right now. And Dali, interestingly enough, uh, my my three year old son loves using Dali because he can just tell me um, what pictures he wants to see, um, and then he can see cats making friends with crocodiles. So it's it's great to sort of see how creative uh, it can help us become. Um, Tom, in terms of sort of uh, that creativity, I guess, and in terms of sort of the services that AI can then bring to consumers, how can artificial intelligence elevate that consumer experience through things like personalized services then or, or buyers using these sort of personalized models? Yeah, I think, <clears throat> excuse me, I think the, the, the potential of generative AI in sort of f for consumer facing businesses, especially, is absolutely huge, if not kind of for, for all businesses. I think all businesses are sort of looking at this year how they can use generative AI. And the whole kind of experience of consumers could, could kind of be transformed. And there's all different ways in which you can see it kind of playing out in terms of how content can be produced automatically. So even if you're, um, for example, a, a retailer and you want to create um, automated product descriptions, you can have that, you know, it's companies like Shopify already allowing you to automate the product descriptions and you can adjust on the model um, whether you want that description to be more playful or more serious or, or what have you. And so you can generate that very quickly and so you don't have to have people in-house writing all of that, that, that content over and over again. You can also personalize things much more. We know that consumers like personalization um, in a lot of ways, and, and this will really allow for kind of high personalization. So you can go onto a website and you could, in theory, see um, a, a description of a product that was designed, that was written effectively just for you. So it's targeted towards you with 
<coughs> image generation, you could have product images which are designed to, um, to to match what you want. So, for example, if you went to look at, I don't know, Ikea and you were looking at a, a barbecue, but it knows that you live in an apartment versus a house, it could you know, show you that product in, in the context of being on a, you know, on a balcony, perhaps with, you know, with other balcony furniture. Whereas if it knows you live in a house and you've explained that, it could show you in a garden scenario. With, you know, it can show you a bit more personalized, um, as well as things like personal assistance. So being able to, um, to navigate uh, retail stores, being able to um, have a more natural conversational um, relationship um, with them in terms of how you you look for products, how you search for products. You don't necessarily have to use keyword prompts that we've sort of got used to doing through search engines um, or even older kind of chatbots. You can now have a far more conversational um, discussion to find as the kind of products that you want. So I think the whole way that that consumers will search for items, will look for things um, online, will interact with brands um, is going to, to change significantly over the next few years. So the potential of it is is huge. And we're really just sort of seeing the early sort of trials of different businesses where companies are kind of experimenting with how it can be used. But I do think as it starts to to, to, to find those use cases, we're going to see a huge kind of shift over, over the coming years. Yeah, it's interesting you say that as well because it's. Um, I think some, the the problem sometimes with for or the challenge sometimes for technology is it's constantly evolving, and so the first iterations people normally mock or they think, oh no, that's not so good. But actually, the artificial intelligence models have evolved so well. Like just mentioning things like chatbots, they're much more refined now. I've seen so many instances where chatbots are used very, very effectively in things like therapy now, like sort of mental health therapy and counselling, so well because again they have refined over time. They have learn from us. So the, the, the really is, it seems like there's really an importance to obviously how companies and brands and, and organizations actually train the AI models. That obviously has to be quite specific. Um, I think that's probably, because uh, one, one of my thoughts about AI is sometimes that is it going to be too generic if you ask to, you know, the especially if you're using open source AI, sort of the chat GPT being a good example of that. You quite often get the same response all the time. So how important is it then in per, if we're going to personalize that consumer journey and if a business is going to use this properly, how important is it to make sure that we are specifically training the artificial intelligence models, these generative AIs, and also making sure consumers know the difference as well? Yeah, it's, it's interesting what you're saying there, Andy, because um, ChatGPT has been trained on, uh, it's often been described as 70% of the internet. And so, um, by default, you kind of get an average of all the knowledge and the um, uh, and the opinions of the internet. But you can prompt it and tell it to take particular perspectives or to behave in particular ways. And and uh, even the makers of ChatGPT and, and these language models didn't really understand how capable they'd be. So, whilst the default answer might be feel a bit generic with the right prompting with the right instructions you can get it to take on different personalities and and to look at things from different perspectives or to talk in different voices so it's uh, i think the cost of training these models runs into the hundreds of millions of pounds and soon they think it's going to be billions of pounds to train the latest models so most companies most people won't be training new models uh, what what companies are finding that gives them the best results at the moment is to is to put the give the models the right instructions to give them the right prompts to change their behaviour and that that's turning out to be in, incredibly powerful at the moment um, even to the extent that there's a lot of excitement in the market research world about synthetic data where they're having um, a common pattern is to take a language model and to give it some prompts and some context and some background and essentially get it to pretend it's a particular consumer or persona. And then you can ask questions of that that instance of model, of that prompt, and and perhaps it will give you the uh, opinion of a um, of a suburban housewife in the outskirts of London or um, of a construction worker from Texas. And with the right prompting and context, you can get the model to behave very differently and to give you different perspectives. And uh, as I said, there's a lot of 
research and experimentation going on with a lot of the uh, market research tech companies looking at how they can apply this to to do things like um, qual and quant research somewhat automatically. Uh, and And so... I don't think it's going to be about training models, at least not for most companies. Uh, if for the for the immediate future, it's going to be about building on the shoulders of these giants who've built these massive models. Jason, my understanding, and you've got better understanding the technicalities of me, but is that the actual the models themselves, because they're trained on such vast quantities of data, and you touched on it there, where the companies are building them themselves don't necessarily know or understand how the answers are reached that they come out with, right? So you, they know that they can pull certain levers and tweak it to change the outputs and they're sort of experimenting with that as, as we go along. But there's a lot of discussion around having a sort of personal AI that, that, that people will sort of have a, a, an AI uh, assistant effectively, which will be on, on, their, you know, on their phone or whatever, which can, they will engage with the world and they can walk around and ask for recommendations and that kind of thing. So I was just kind of wondering what you were saying, whether you'd, we could kind of end up with a place where we need to understand what consumers kind of were thinking with nutritional research, but we also kind of need to know what their AI assistant is thinking because we don't know. We could almost do research on the, assist, on the, on the AI assistant to know not just what you know, someone, um, a, you know, a, a Gen Z is thinking, but also what the Gen Z's AI is going to recommend to them I, I think you're right. I think the use of AI technology by consumers is going to change consumer behavior. I do think it will change consumer behavior. Um, on one level, they might be much more knowledgeable uh, or they might be able to more easily interpret the benefits of a particular product or service. Um, you know, we're finding or companies who are doing studies and academic institutions doing studies are finding that one of the biggest benefits of these types of AIs is they help people with, who, who are just at like a beginner level of knowledge or skill in a particular area or task to get advice and coaching to raise their skill levels. And you'll probably see that play out or, or potentially see that play out as consumers are making better informed decisions because they've got an assistant helping them helping them do that um don't th there might be an aspect of you know you you grow alongside your assistant and there might be an aspect of training your assistant and continually refining your own assistant um but it but it might also be that as your assistant has access to more and more knowledge about you then it can uh, predict or in anticipate your wants and your needs. So I think there's a huge amount of possibility there. I mean, there's massive possibilities there. <laughs> this is absolutely fascinating as well because it's this, for some people, it may seem a bit far fetched. Are we all going to have these? But actually, again, that process is already underway. Profiles are already created around us. We already have our kind of digital personas, whether we like it or not, uh, you know, our, our algorithms are set up for the way we use devices or shop in certain ways. So it's not that far fetched either to think that mm. these are going to be very interesting, um, sort of concepts to really take into consideration. And especially working at a, a market intelligence company, it's going to be really interesting to see, um, what the evolution is for us. And um, how do you think artificial intelligence then will change the way that market intelligence is gathered? How, how we ourselves analyze it, how we disseminate that data as well? Like how, how do our roles and, and companies like ours, how, how does that role change now um, in light of AI? At the moment, it's very early days, but it's clear that this is going to have a, a really big effect on our industry. Um, there's a lot of people quite excited, but also cautious about the idea of synthetic data. And synthetic data is, is like what I was talking about earlier, where you have... Um, data that is generated by an AI to give you a perspective of um, consumers. Um, and that might be in a, in a qual setting or in a quant setting. And there have been some initial experiments done where, where they've demonstrated that they, the concurrence with human research is above 90%. 
but you can do the research in seconds. And so the difference between fielding some research and getting an answer 24 hours later to fielding some research and getting an answer in 10 minutes, it's probably going to change some of the things you can do. I think it will only work for certain circumstances, for certain types of research that we're doing. But I do think synthetic data will will play a, will take a place in, in our industry and we will be using it, I'm sure, in, in due course. Um, for us, one of the biggest things I think is going to be the power of these models to understand and interpret content. And I do think they'll have a, a big role to play at Mintel and in other companies like us in helping people find the most relevant content and inter interpret that content so that they can quickly get to the information they need and the insights they need to, to help them do their tasks. So I think for us, it's going to have a, a massive impact on productivity uh, and for other companies that, um, that use market research services. Uh, the other thing that it's particularly good at is when you have a huge amount of data to interpret, and particularly raw data, so if it's a lot of text to process or a, a lot of interview transcripts or, um, or even images these days, the newer models can actually look at an image and, and extract data from that. The models that uh, are, are emerging are particularly good at understanding that, and they can do it really quickly and at scale. So um, that opens up opportunities for processing data and doing things that previously would have been hugely manually intensive, but now you can do really quickly and at, and at scales that you haven't been able to do before. So I, I think it will improve the quality of research um, by enabling us to do things at a bigger scale and, and more quickly. And, you know, I, I don't know if either of you have, have ended up working on coding verbatims or um, or looking through qualitative research or any of our quant research. Perhaps that's, that's probably other people in the Mintel team that do that. Um, but there is an opportunity to apply this technology there to, to, to as I said, to help speed up what we do. Um, I don't think it's particular, the current models are particularly good at creating insight. So, as, as you said, a, a lot of, you, you'll find if you ask ChatGPT a question, some of the answers that it gives you are a bit uh, generic. And similarly, if you ask one of these models to create some insight from some data you put in front of it, the, the answers are a bit, um, a, a bit generic and, and perhaps not very insightful. Now, some of that will get better as the models get better. And some of that will get better as, people, as we get better at using it. But uh, I still think there are places where we will use AI and places where um, many places where humans and human expertise is essential. Yeah, I think that, that's a really interesting point because I think it's it, in terms, definitely in terms of efficiency and from what I see from a category point of view in beauty and personal care, I've kind of likened, like this, as you, you mentioned, the speed that AI can do certain things. In some regards, it almost makes the seemingly impossible possible just in terms of the fact that it would have taken us potentially our whole lifetimes to maybe find an ingredient or a molecule that can be used in a consumer product uh, or in a formulation. But actually AI, through training it through clinical trials and databases um, and all this this variety of data sources, it can actually sift through and look for these molecules potentially 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 better because it knows where to look or it can it can at least point the human in the right place to explore absolutely look looking outside of our industry i think uh, and the benefits that ai might bring to society that's one of the places where i'm most excited is the idea of using ai to speed up and improve scientific research and there's lots and lots of applications um, like the ones you hinted at there, that you mentioned there, I, that I think is going to make a big difference to humanity, I hope. I'm an optimist, by the way. I, um, <laughs> I find it very difficult to look at this topic pessimistically. Um, I'll, I'll have a go if, if you want to try that later. But um, I probably should have asked you right, the, both of you right at the start, the, the, 
the pod actually just said, are you optimist or pessimist? Just to see which camp you're in, really. Uh, but no, I, I think it's it's it is exciting to see what can be done, I think, and how we can. And I do believe it can it can be used in some very negative ways. Um, and I think they're probably more well documented than what we're discussing here, and maybe a little bit more exaggerated and headline grabbing than what, we're, than what we're discussing here. But I do think the the positives around, even again, just thinking about it from an industry perspective looking at sort of finding sustainable alternatives, like AI can help us to find those sustainable solutions much quicker. As you said, scientific research can sort of be propelled forward through this. Even things like, um, again, to use a industry specific example, um, looking at things in the fragrance industry, for example, we have constant changing regulations and the, um, the resource, the ingredient resource is constantly fluctuating. So prices are high or they're low or an ingredient is scarce. So again, AI can help you find alternatives very quickly so that you can make things more cost effective. It can make things more commercially viable and scalable. So I think there is a lot of, um, a lot of sort of the legwork stuff being done in the background that is very, very interesting. Um, I do think as well, though, from what you were saying, there is, and I don't know, Tom, if you, if you feel this as well, but there's possibly a lot of, obstacles to get over though still in the in sort of the short term with the consumer so with regards to building up that trust um and and when you talk about the synthetic data i mean how how far do we need to go with that to for it to be trusted for people to actually look upon it favorably um i do know that you know i i I have used a generative ai model before and then asked uh, received a response asked where it got that data from and then it's told me that it's made it up it tells me it doesn't have it. And it's kind of like, oh, okay. So very difficult to build trust uh, on that regard. So is there still a long way to go in that in, in that regard as well, in terms of building that trust and those obstacles to overcome? Yes, I think so. Um, I think just going back to the, the first point, I would say about being an optimist or pessimist, I think as with most things humans have ever invented, it depends entirely on how they <coughs> will be used. So you can you can, depending on how you deploy that, will depend on whether it's a positive or a negative. And who you are, uh, whether you're looking short-term, long-term, high-level or low-level, is going to depend on whether you think it's a good thing or a bad thing. So, you know, it's, I think at its core, generative AI is a, is a productivity tool. And like you say, it really takes the legwork out of a lot of, um, a lot of tasks for, um, for people. It allows you to be far more um, productive as a business. It allows you to be more personalized. It allows you to localize content, and product offerings, and that kind of thing very easily. But obviously, as with everything, there's people doing those jobs. And so they, you know, those jobs no longer need doing. Now, as with almost every technological innovation since the Industrial Revolution, um, technology tends to create more, uh, more jobs than it destroys. But that doesn't take away from the fact that obviously there's people doing those jobs and destroying them, and it takes time to, to retrain them. I, I was I was doing some research ahead of the pod today, and um, Corn Ferry are predicting a, a shortfall of 85 million people in skilled roles by 2030. And I know there are many, many industries at the moment where um, if you ask them surveys, they say their progress is being held up because they can't hire the right skilled workers, the right skilled, skilled employees. So, and then if you combine that with perhaps some of the demographic changes that are happening and, and maybe even got accelerated by COVID, there's potentially the risk that AI is going to replace jobs may be mitigated by the fact that many of those kinds of jobs are going to have a lack of people to do them anyway. And I, I don't think it's going to replace people in, uh, not, not in the, in the near future. I think it will help people be much more productive. And there's that, that common meme, that common trope going around at the moment where AI is not going to replace your job. Someone who's good at using AI is going to replace your, is going to replace your job. And I do think, I, I think that's, that's where we'll go. But as I said, I'm, I'm very optimistic about things. So. <laughs> well, but it raises a good point as well, because that was in a world where AI can do so much. As you mentioned, Tom, as well, like the, the rot constantly evolved, like with tech technology in, or tech innovation, this has always been the case. So what is the role of humans? What is the role of the human expert going forward? How, how can we 
how can we collaborate with AI to produce even better insights and results? Because as we kind of, I think both of you have alluded to earlier on in the conversation about how you're still going to need the human element. It's, AI is not going to replace it. Well, whilst it can be much more intelligent than us, it still will need us. Mm. What, what is that role going to look like then going forward? So I would say, I think um, that the AI is largely, as you said, a kind of productivity tool and helps you kind of cut these, um, makes you far more productive. But I think from what I've seen is that AI is not necessarily so good at the um, particular strategic level. You know, what's the direction? You know, it's not going to decide what strategy you want to apply. So whether you're looking at kind of company level, the direction you're going, or whether you're thinking about, uh, say, an advertising campaign or a product kind of launch, it could probably speed up that process and cut, you know, and, and create a lot of the content, that kind of thing. But it's not going to be able to set that strategy and see that kind of direction that you should be going in. And I think for the, the, the kind of human angle, there's still that that big picture bit to look at. And so it's 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 as with a lot of tech innovations over over the centuries, it's 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 taking on more of that kind of legwork. Except that what's different about this is that it's taking on the kind of what has historically been the creativity work, which is not something computers have traditionally done before, um, and free people up to, to sort of look at the, the, the bigger picture, the strategy, the, the, the direction, the branding, that kind of thing. Um, I think AI also can't really deliver empathy, which I think is the other thing that's going to be quite important um, from a consumer perspective. It's still, at the end of the day, an algorithm. But will it be able to? In the future, will it be able to? Will it be able to, as, as the machine constantly learns, are we going to work? Uh, I'm very much looking in the crystal ball now, by the way. Um, but are we going to live in a world where it can learn that? And it is going to help help with that in the future as well? Is that going to be something? And also, what are then the ethical implications of relying on artificial intelligence to do certain things? I, I, I mean, I think it can fake it now, right? I mean, there are people putting mental health chatbots together that uh, are apparently, and, and I haven't seen any studies on it, but that are apparently quite effective. But it is, it is artificial, and I, and I think there's always going to be, um, and there's always going to be a place for the authentic. So I, I think e- even if even if these tools become so good at things that they approach or exceed human level. Uh, performance on certain tasks, I still think that there are going to be a bunch of things like empathy and and um, relationships where then the uh, the authenticity is an essential part of that that ingredient. So I, I do agree with you there, there, Tom. They models will get better and better, and they will become more and more powerful. But I I, I still agree with you there as well, Tom. In that in that they'll, they'll always need someone to to provide direction and whilst they might have more and more influence on decision making and and the decisions that humans make I, ultimately i think you probably still need a human at least in our in our current world a human to be responsible and accountable for those decisions uh, but it's going to be it's going to be interesting i i don't think we can predict what things are going to be like in 5 years time not really yeah because it's going to be so quick, quick. And I think it depends what we're talking about. So we just decided to specifically talk about generative AI and needed to keep a vaguely kind of walled put on the discussion. But I think as you move forward, one of the things that's being discussed um, a lot and certainly in much more dystopian terms is is artificial general intelligence, which is AGI, which is more like an AI that can kind of do everything, which is still nothing that hasn't been invented yet, but is being worked on by a lot of companies with lots of money. And that's a whole different kind of, thing i think not going to that whole discussion (laughs) yeah that's um i don't i don't know enough about that to to talk about it and actually probably no one does really right every everyone is just pontificating but there are there's a lot of scare stories and there's a lot of people very concerned about what that might mean for humanity if because conceptually abstractly the you could have entities that are conscious with um with will with their own decision making and and um and motivations that are a hundred times more intelligent than the smartest human being and what does that mean um and that's why there's 
all, all the calls about AI safety are all about aligning. Uh, a lot of it is about aligning the motivations and values of a emergent AI systems with what's good for humanity. It's a very, very complex area. It's, a, it's an interesting one as well, because the minute you mention that, I then start thinking of Hollywood movies and thinking when you mentioned about the scare stories and how movies for years have basically been telling us that the robots are going to rise up against us. And also, actually, when you, Tom, when you were talking about the, um, uh, when we were talking about sort of the conscious AI as well, I couldn't help but think, have you ever seen that film, Her, that's got Joaquin Phoenix in mm-hmm. and he basically falls in love and has a relationship with his voice assistant, essentially, and it's very... It's, it was wacky then, but it definitely seems like it's more of a reality now, which is also <laughs> scary. Um, just with regards to then what we're talking about with um, the generative AI stuff then, to, to bring us back onto that, what do you think are some of the most significant ways that generative AI is going to impact our lives um, in the coming years? I know we sort of said it's difficult to predict the next five years, but in, in terms of looking at what we know now about generative AI um, and use, use cases of that, what would you say are the most significant ways um, that, it, that it is going to impact us? How is it going to change the way that we work or that we learn or even just interact with the world around us? Um, shall I start on that one? That's a big question. Uh, where to start? Um, I think from my perspective, um, particularly with the consumer tech team and the research that we do, I think one of the things that I find most interesting is how it's potentially going to change the, the sort of devices that we use. So, um, you know, since what, 2007 when the iPhone was launched, um, smartphones have absolutely dominated the way that we interact with the world. Um, and smartphone shopping has, has kind of transformed the way retailers operate, the way we search for information, the way we look for information we're out and about. And there's a lot of, um, for a while, there's been a lot of discussion around what's next. So smartphones have gradually kind of reached a limit of their of their kind of design hardware capabilities. So yes, they get all the iterative improvements, but to be honest, they've kind of largely reached a form factor where they all look roughly the same and they kind of have, you know, the same kind of style and stuff. So the question is actually, does this technology allow us to enter into a new phase where the smartphone perhaps could start to maybe not disappear because we've still got desktops kicking around, but certainly move into the next the next kind of phase of, of hardware technology in terms of how we interact. And there's been some quite interesting um, kind of products, early kind of products being being released recently. Um, just in the last few weeks, the kind of humane AI uh, chip uh, pin, which attaches, is a sort of pin which attaches to your, your, your clothing and acts as your kind of AI personal assistant has been launched. Um, what do you think it, of that? What? I mean, do you think that's got legs, as it were? <laughs> I think in itself, I, it's hard to tell the your product. I think it's still, you know, it's a kind of concept idea. But I think it's an interesting idea that, that we could potentially move in that direction. Right? Mm. So this idea that actually instead of having to pull out your phone and look down all like this all the time, actually you can interact much more naturally. And I think a few years ago, there was the kind of talk around that we'll have Alexa and Siri, Siri and all the voice um, you know, we, we start controlling everything with voice, but actually they were quite poor because you have to basically instruct it. To, it's very good if you want to play a specific song or if you mm-hmm. want it to tell you the directions to a specific place, but you can't kind of have a conversation with it in any way. Whereas actually with generative AI, you can do that. And we've got also things like um, Meta launched last week. They're, they're kind of Ray-Ban glasses, which also have the Meta yeah. AI built into it. Um, and so you just see the kind of wearables and AI space start to come together where y- you can kind of interact with it on a, as you're going around. So you, there's less reasons to pull your phone out of your pocket and, and stare down at it I, or I scan totally something agree, with a camera. Yeah. And I think that will sort of, and like I said, we're still at the early stage of what that hardware looks like, what that next generation of hardware looks like. And yes, the like, humane AI, AI, AI pin has come out and these meta glasses and we're still looking for that form factor you know apple's working on its own kind of ai tool and obviously recently launched its kind of headset but what what is the next form factor but i think it'll be interesting to see that the smartphone feels like it's been around for a long time and it also you know has it, it, it's limiting in, in in many ways and that you have to pull out and stare at it and poke your finger at it yeah so actually how will that change in the way we do it and i was talking with um johnny forsyth of the food and drink um analysts here about how it can change the way we interact with food and particularly in terms of the AI pin if it can interact with your other 
wearables, for example. So if you imagine it's with your watches, it can now track your blood sugar levels, your heart rate, and that kind of thing. And showing an example where you could hold, you can hold a, a food, a, you know, a chocolate bar or something out in front of you, which they did in the trial, but it actually can tell you whether or not, you know, you, you should have that, whether you've had too much sugar for the day, whether or not it be healthy, whether or not it's something that it might have an allergen in it or something like that. And so the, the capability to interact with products on the go and seamlessly could change quite dramatically, I think. Yeah, I, I totally agree about that. I, um, but I, <clears throat> if I had to bet, I would bet that the Meta's approach or anyone doing augmented reality with glasses is likely to be more effective um, and in particular, because um, because it's, you've got your screen and your camera in the same place, so the AI can will be able to take input from everything it sees you do, and so it could do that passively and continually. I mean, that would be a bit scary, but it, but conceptually, it could understand what you do all day, every day. And then use that to help you remember things. Where did I put my keys? Um, uh, and, and all sorts of things like that. And I, I do think you're right. I think the AI and in, and generative AI to an extent is, is going to enable different ways of interacting with technology. I mean, in longer term, maybe it's contact lenses, not, uh, not glasses, but, um, for the next five years, I, if they can make it work, if they if people if they can get people to accept it, then then I would bet that some kind of augmented reality device will take over from smartphones. I um, think that's that's the key thing as well, though acceptance, because I kind of feel that technology has always been more capable than what we're actually willing to accept. I think uh, that's always been the problem over time. I remember that when the the first iPhones and the tablets first came out, that there, there needed to be a shift from obviously keypads and things like that to then oh, look, we've actually got nothing now on a screen. I remember we used to have the, the home button and a couple of other buttons. So there's always this, I think, any, whenever you think of innovation, um, I constantly think of the, the Maya principle, the Raymond Lowy Maya principle of most advanced yet accessible, because I always feel like, or, or yet yeah, accepted, because you can have the best thing in the world, but it's all about how you tell that story to consumers. For example, mm. the things we're talking about today with the, with, uh, the sort of the meta glasses um, or the, the humane pin or things like that, 10 years ago, it just, it's, it's sci-fi, isn't it? It's just people just wouldn't connect with it. It needs to, it needs to have that real world familiarity in order to catch on. Otherwise, we're never fully going to accept it. Um, that, I mean, there's, there's so many famous examples in history of tech advancements that just came way too soon. And then yeah. 10 years later, it's, you know, I mean, the, the whole tablet scenario, um, I'm not going to get into Apple v Microsoft on that one, but there are, there are so many stories over the years where they, they introduced this technology almost too early. Okay. Google launched their glasses about eight eight years ago, was it? Something mm, like that. All the time, and, yeah. Yeah. And, and very quickly pulled back from that because because it didn't work. And and actually, a lot of that was about people's acceptance. So I think you're absolutely right, Andy. And I'm not sure how I'm not sure what it's going to take to get acceptance for it either. But I think um, two parts. Of that. I think one thing is you can if technology is launched before the infrastructure is ready, then mm-hmm. it's too early. I mean, there's plenty of examples of electric cars, for example, are the same where if you launch them before there's you know enough infrastructure around. And I think it's the same with this sort of technology. Think about the early smartphones. Yes, you could, you could have a smartphone, you could go on it, but all of the websites for all the companies and everyone was set up for desktop computers, laptops. So the experience wasn't particularly good. Then over the years, obviously, smartphones allowed the development of you know, social media platforms, smart shopping, and everything else. And so now the whole world is designed around the smartphone. Mm. Um, and obviously, then if you jump to a new form factor, everything's designed for the smartphone. So it's going to be really hard to navigate websites, to look at anything, whatever. But I think we're already seeing, you know, we'll start to see the, these conversational chatbots perhaps start to develop on some websites, which maybe you can use on, on, on laptops and computers. You'll start to, people get more used to, because it's something we're still not used to, is actually engaging with computers in a conversational way. I think it's still mm-hmm. weird. Mm-hmm. We're still used to going to Google and putting in a, you know, keyword prompt that you want to look up. Um, and this is going to kind of change that a bit. And I think as people perhaps get more right. used yeah. to that, then actually the, the way in which you interact with 
computer starts to switch and actually then it becomes a bit more natural to say well actually i could just i could just talk to it and that, and that's fine and maybe we'll see that shift over time i do like you know this isn't something which is going to happen you know in 2024 everyone's going to throw away their smartphones and have a whole new form factor this is something which is going to be a steady steady shift and it's also about having a company come out and actually do that in a way that makes it cool and the one that is you know apple has always been the one that somehow can make the most socially unacceptable things socially acceptable i always always use the example of the the um the the apple um uh, earphones where no everyone just thought you'd look like if anyone else had released earphones would have the weird stick thing and no wires down everyone just would have no one would have worn them because you look silly but somehow apple can make it work make it cool Mm -hmm. make it socially acceptable make it aspirational um i wonder if it'd be the same with you know uh, smart glasses and headsets that you know Google and Microsoft can do all they want, but somehow Apple will will make it look cool. And you know, I think it's also right. worth noting that that you know, I think there's rumours that um, OpenAI, for example, are working with Johnny Ive, the old former Apple designer, on designing some hardware that will be designed specifically for 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 ChatGPT and that kind of thing. So you might start to get some much better, more intuitive, more natural devices start to come along, which gradually take off some of the tasks that smartphones have done over the last 10, 15 years. I, I think that's a, a good prediction. In five years' time, I think there'll be other options and they'll be starting to get adoption. I'm not, not quite sure which one it will be or who it will be, but I would bet it would be more around the augmented reality mm. type thing where you've got a camera and a screen and some way of providing input to it in a in an effortless, frictionless way. Mm. And if you can do that, then I, I think that changes the possibilities. I think it opens up a huge amount of possibilities for what you can do with the technology. And when you combine that with AI, I mean, may, maybe that's when everyone has a, an assistant whispering in their ear kind of continuously. Although that would be a bit creepy, right? <laughs> I think that's that's fascinating, and I, I actually think it's quite interesting, Tom. Hearing you speak about um, sort of how the smart the smartphone evolution, how we're going to move away from smartphones. I think in my mind that is just it's almost like making a, a visible sort of recognition of the fact that of just how exponential this growth has been for AI from obviously for decades of not really doing much with machine learning to then since the turn of millennia the the, the exponential growth in and capability in what it can do has just rocketed forward because you're talking there about the smartphone, which again is another new technological innovation of the last couple of decades, and that now being rendered obsolete, which is or not obsolete, obviously, but you know what I mean. In, in just in terms of how much we rely or have relied on that in the last few years on that one piece of technology, the fact that now something can come come in and trump that just kind of shows just how quickly this is moving, how quickly this is shifting. And so I do think it is a fascinating space. So I think we're right to be cautious. I think for those people that are not pessimistic, but maybe a little bit cautious on these things, I think that that is right to be in place, particularly whilst I know we're not, we're not going to discuss today, but whilst regulation is still sort of up in the air on that and how we regulate AI, that is obviously of utmost importance, but probably a bigger conversation um, than what we're talking about right now. But I do think it's fascinating just to see the opportunities uh, that we'll go to um, in the future. I guess one final question that I then had for both of you then um, is probably to revisit that idea of optimist and pessimist, which I <laughs> believe both of you are probably optimists anyway. Um, and I know we did say it's difficult to predict the next five years, but how how do you see the long-term implications then for artificial intelligence, specifically generative AI as well, because that's what we've been discussing today? And um, what are the long-term implications of this technology? And sort of how excited are you by what you're seeing now and what you expect to see? That was a big question I asked, so I don't, I don't know who yeah. wants to tell you first. <laughs> so you start, if we're Jason. talking about, uh, and so I, I would say if we're talking about generative AI, I, I think right now is generative AI's moment. As AI in general keeps developing, the, the capabilities of these Gen AI models will be harnessed and probably connected together in ever more sophisticated ways to provide more, more capabilities than are possible now. And, and if not, if not getting towards artificial general intelligence, at least, at least being able to do a good facsimile of it. Uh, it used, it used to be that the Turing test was, could you tell whether there was a human at the end of, at the other end of a chatbot? Well, very clearly over the past 12 months, the answer, and empirically, because people measured it, was no, you couldn't. And so they, 
change their mind about that's not a good enough test to determine whether something is intelligent because they're, they're clearly not conscious and intelligent. But I think there'll be similar advances using generative AI to make AI systems that appear to be more and more capable. And it will change the way consumers interact with technology and it will enhance productivity for, for people working in companies. And I think that will be massive. I do think that will be massive. And there will be disruption as some things become either so so much quicker that we don't need as many people doing them or become obsolete overall. That that will happen, but I think it will take time. And I don't think, and, and I do think that overall there'll be in, enough work to do <laughs> Uh, that, that I don't think it will cause a long-term disruption. It will be short-term disruption, I think. Yeah, I uh, uh, agree. Um, although I think that, I, I don't know if I'm more pessimistic, but I think the, the disruption could at least be, be longer term. Um, but I think, yeah, for me, I, I feel like at the moment with generative AI, we're, we're very much kind of at the first phase where it's still fairly new. The companies themselves are still sort of honing the products. I think people are sort of testing them out themselves, and it's largely being done on sort of an individual basis. People are using it to sort of craft emails or product descriptions or that kind of thing. I think over the next um, year, a couple of years, we'll see companies start to roll out products much more, more kind of design structured products that are built on AI, which they've sort of been building and testing this year, and then probably in sort of three to five years you'll see that much more embedded in the way that we interact with 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 everything really i think that the, the way we interact will be far more natural in terms of of operating and, and interacting with businesses and how and, and websites and the and everything around us really it's a new way of sort of engaging with with the internet and i think it will cause um, disruption in terms of you know there, there will be new kind of roles that will be generate there'll be new ways that we have to get used to doing it and we haven't really got to talking about the issue around um, Hollywood and film and, and, and TV and the strikes but obviously that's another area where trying to work out how this fits into existing industries is just going to take a bit of time you know it's going to take a bit of back and forth and I think um, it can feel very new and very scary and when you talk about five-year jumps it feels like it's a huge, dr drastic change. But I think if I learned anything in, in, in sort of watching consumer behavior and stuff for like 10 years, along I've been here, it's, it's that actually consumers adapt to change remarkably well and remarkably fast, even if it's quite scary when you think about it. You know, and you have to look back five years or 10 years to see that, you know, we lived in a completely different world in terms of how we interact with each other and, the, and you know, everything. Um, so, yeah, I, I, I think people will adapt to that change. There will be a lot of change. If you look at it kind of in a snapshot, it's huge and scary, but people will, will adapt to it. It'll produce far more uh, exciting things um, that, uh, that we may not even realize is produced by AI. Um, and, uh, you know, in terms of things like translation tools, instant translation, um, again, in TV and, and advertising, being able to localize adverts or, or products you know you can you can effectively uh, you know change you no longer have that awkward dubbing for example on, a, on, a, on an advert which goes into a new market you can adapt it slightly to the to the culture you can make people's mouths change to match the language that they're talking um you know it, it gives you huge potential to to reach out to markets and a lot of the biggest companies are, are sort of already exploring how that that works yeah, no, it really is fascinating. It's fascinating hearing both of you speak on this as well. I I've, I've really am grateful to hearing both of your perspectives on this. I think you're both right as well. It's, it's, it's such an exciting world to look at. And I think it is, it is difficult when you're talking about those big jumps. You do get a bit scared. Sometimes the barriers do go up a little bit. But I do think that the point you make just there at the end there about consumers always adapting. I think if, we, if we've learned anything over the last five years and the massive amounts of disruption globally that people have been under for many different reasons. It, the one sort of prevailing message from that is that humans do adapt um, and we do adapt to our situations very well. So I think consumer behavior is constantly going to evolve with this technology. It's just about, again, how we can fit all those two things together. Um, I, once again, I really do want to thank you both for 
joining me today, sparing some time to go through this. I know there's so many more. I have so many more questions, which I may well just bug you in the office about at some point um, off record, um, because it really is a fascinating uh, sort of topic. And I've really enjoyed speaking to both of you about this. Um, so I really hope that you've, you've both enjoyed your time on the pod today um, and really appreciate everything that you have said uh, for today. So thank you both uh, for joining in. But the conversation uh, doesn't end here. Thanks to everyone for listening to this. But if you do want to continue the conversation, you can head over to Mintel's LinkedIn and Instagram and let us know what you think. Uh, please, positive comments only. Um, we'd love to hear your thoughts, though, either way, um, on artificial intelligence, particularly on generative AI and how you think um, sort of the, the future is going to look in this space. Um, if you want to know more about Mintel and some of the stuff we're doing, particularly in this area or in many other areas, then visit Mintel.com and sign up to become a member of the free Mintel Spotlight community. Uh, also, make sure you never miss an episode by subscribing to this podcast and liking this podcast on iTunes, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. Uh, but all that's left for me to say is once again, a huge thank you to both Jason and Tom uh, for joining me today. Uh, it's goodbye for now, and we'll catch you next time for the next episode of Little Conversation. Little Conversation.